Hi, this is the Interior Collective, a podcast for the business of beautiful living, presented by IDCO Studio, and I'm Anastasia Casey. Today's topic redefining traditional style, something that has been weighing heavy on my heart lately, and I think it's time to just expand the conversation. I wanted to discuss reframing the concept of traditional interiors. What has predominantly been a white Eurocentric definition of traditional design is finally being dismantled with the recent showcasing of Black and BIPOC voices in their work in the industry. Traditions aren't a universal thing, so traditional design shouldn't be either. As we discuss the shift in traditional interiors, we'll also dig deeper into quality versus quantity of clients and how you can further establish your own definition of traditional style. Today's guest, Gail Davis, is what I consider to be the industry's fairy godmother. She's constantly connecting designers with who they need to know. Gail and I have been friends for a few years now as IDCO designed and developed her website back in 2020. Since then, Gail has hosted me on her podcast and also attended Design Camp in Los Angeles earlier this year, allowing us to finally meet face to face. Today, it's an immense honor to get to host Gail on the Interior Collective and return the favor. Gail studied at New York School of Interior Design and honed her craft interning at two of New York City's most prestigious firms, Bunny Williams, Inc. and David Kleinberg Design Associates. Now, having practiced for over 15 years, Gail is the principal designer and owner of Gail Davis Design, known for their concierge-level interior design services. Her projects have been featured in House Beautiful, El Decor, AD Pro, Domino, and so many more. Gail is the podcast host of Design Perspectives and the resident webinar host for Schumacher three years running. Gail, welcome. I am so glad to have you. (laughs) (laughs) Wow, I sound amazing. (laughs) You are amazing. (laughs) That was a a really easy (laughs) intro to write, actually. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much for having me. This is going to be so much fun. You know, I do anything for you. I know you would. You are so (laughs) generous with your time with me, and I'm so grateful for that. Let's go ahead and dive right in. Gail, do you want to tell us a little bit more about your background and what work you have been doing on your own podcast, Design Perspectives? Yeah. So let me see. So I got into design after I was in the fashion industry, and I was just burned out. And I was like, I need something different. And um, I took one class at NYSED, and it's so funny because everybody thinks design is so much fun. And it was a a class of 12 of us. And by the time the first semester was done, it was down to two of us. And I just, I really fell in love with it because we bought our home. And that's what really got my gears shifting into wanting something different. Um, And so I just did it. I interned for, you know, Bunny Williams. I didn't know who that was, which was quite hilarious for me not to know. But once again, I wasn't (laughs) in the industry to know. And it was just such a master class of design for me. Um, And then going from there to uh, David, which was also, you know, Parrish Hadley, but he was like the Hadley of the Parrish Hadley. And then, um, I don't know, the the podcast came about uh, me hanging out with two of my designer friends and we were out to dinner one night and they were like, you just give such great advice. You should do a podcast. I'm like, are you kidding me? And then I just went home and I was like, okay, how do I do a podcast? And I just started from there. I mean, it's it's called Design Perspectives, but it's just really taking on a life of its own because it's a little bit about design. Um, just backtracking for a second, I also was asked or told, why do a podcast? There's so many out there. And I was like, well... One, yeah, you're right, but everybody has their own spin on it. And I was like, and there's not really a podcast, a design podcast out there with a person of color leading it, you know, which is very different because there's a new guard, I should say, or there's a new spin since 2020 of um, designers of color and being interviewed. And it's just super important that our voice is heard. I hope I said that right. Yeah. (laughs) And not just that, but that your voice is the guiding voice, not just the responding voice. Yeah. And it's, it's fun to have conversations with other designers of color and to talk about how we, you know, how we work with clients and, you know, how we're perceived. And then it's also fun to like, I've spoken to Hadley editor of, you know, house beautiful and, um, 
I've spoken to editor in chief, um, uh, was it Assad? I'm sorry, Assad, Assad Sarkat of El Decor. And he, you know, he was, he's the first black editor in chief of a major publication. And just to hear, you know, what he was anticipating and, um, and, you know, what it meant for him to step up. And then also to hear, like, you know, I'm going to be honest and not so nice things that people said to me about, well, you know, what's going on and why is he in charge? And I'm like, well, why not? (laughs) You know, it's just sad that whenever people of color step up and they're leaders, we're, we're vetted differently. And we're questioned, you know, like look at Katanji, excuse me, Judge Katanji uh, Brown Jackson and how she's so qualified and like the asinine questions that were being asked of her. And it's so funny that unfortunately, anytime we're put in a position where asked these ridiculous questions and we're vetted and, you know, you know, it's like a sit back and let's see if they can handle it. Let's see what they're going to do. If you are not already following Design Perspectives, it's going to be linked in the show notes. We'll talk about it again later in the show. But let's go ahead and dig into some of the questions that I put together for you, specifically around the concept of traditional design. So traditional design has a very black and white definition as far as what is widely accepted in the industry. As someone who was formally trained and classically trained in in interior design, how do you define traditional design from that standpoint? Okay, so traditional design for me is a very, I'm going to say a very Southern thing. My, I'm trained classically, yes, but I also grew up in a home where my family is from the South. Um, my grandparents particular and going to my grandparents home. It's very funny. I was just saying to someone, I said, Southern people receive people into their home. Right. And there's a way that you receive them. You have the conversation with them, but when you walk into a home um, and traditional for me, it's just something about, it just feels like it's this warm hug. And as I like to say to my clients, like a hug from Jesus, where you just feel like you can just let your guard down and that where you everywhere you sit is super comfortable. The food is amazing. The drinks are amazing. But the drinks and the glasses, like everything is um, done with love. That's the best way I can describe what traditional means for me. You know, it's not just a show. Like I see a lot of design and it's it's hollow. It doesn't pull you in. You know, like the picture is there and it's like, it's kind of cold. It's very sterile. It's very black and white. It's very neutral tones. It's very cream color. And I'm like, we live in color and I want to be pulled in. I want to like, I want not just eye candy, but I, I want to feel like I'm in that room. Like it needs to be a visceral reaction. Does that make sense? Yeah, that absolutely makes sense. I think that there has definitely been a trend over the last few years for things to be much more layered. There's been a lot more color. And I just know that cyclically, that's probably going to be back on its way out because things only last, you know, seven years in the industry before it goes back to being stripped down and super clean and super modern um, and really minimal. And I love your take on how the spaces actually evoke a feeling and it's not just about how things are put together. I love that so much. What did you learn about designing in school to take those traditional designs and actually make them into that? Space planning. (laughs) I had this one professor that she was insane about space planning. And she said, Before you think of anything else, before you think of making a pretty room, everything needs to work and everything needs to be. And the other thing is also with Bunny, everything needs to be a workhorse, not just to have an ottoman, to have an ottoman, but that ottoman has to do double duty to hold books. It has to do double duty to hold booties, you know, people sitting on it, um, drinks, like whatever. It's funny that the space planning was the space planning and color. My color class was the most intense two classes that if I always look back, that's the thing that I always draw from. Like I used to see color, like, you know, very just like surface and then taking the class and having to paint the colors and 
and the teacher would show us a blue and it's like, okay, make that blue. And then having to get the paint color to be the right color, you got to see the nuance of the color, which was so intense, but it was so refreshing because then you just didn't see that blue as a blue or that brown as a brown or that green as green. You got to experience the layering of that color to get that particular color to really make sense. Wow, that's amazing. I also went to art school, not for interior design, but I remember taking the color theory class and it was absolutely life-changing. And suddenly, I mean, suddenly I'm that person even looking at whites and I can look at 30 different whites and say that those are different colors, but to really gain an appreciation of, like you said, cooler tones and warmer tones and understanding what those undertones are and how that can really affect the depth and the richness of a space. Yes. Yeah. Just like adding a, like a pinch of, you know, black to it, it just changes it to a whole different color. And then, you know, also visiting museums and then seeing the color now and really experiencing it from after having the color theory class and going in. And now you're like, oh my God, now you see why this painting makes so much sense. Or like you're so pulled in because it's also the ground, the whatever colors on that wall, it's pulling you in. And it's not um, stage like upstaging it, but it's just like pulling you in, and you're like, oh my god! Like I, I love Farrow and Ball colors because they're so earthy and so tonal, and it just I have such a visceral reaction every time I go into that store. Oh, that's amazing. Um, okay, so you had mentioned earlier how you know since George Floyd's murder in 2020, it's been trendy to have <laughs> to have BIPOC designers, Black designers, Indigenous designers on interviews, etc. And I'm curious for you, how do you want the concept of traditional design in the future to maybe be redefined, to be more about that feeling like you were discussing and less about its Southern style and the traditional space planning or the traditional fabrics and wallpapers? I, I'm interested in how traditional design can be reshaped moving forward to be about other things than just the c pattern combinations or the the canvases and tapestries or the upholstery that is so well known and associated with traditional design. Well, it's funny because like you said at the top of the show, traditional is very different for everyone, you know, and traditional can mean so much to each person to each nationality you know like last night I was at dinner with my Italian friends and it was a very traditional meal and then it was also a very traditional setting and it stems back from the grandparents the great-grandparents like the lineage and for and I'll say for black people it's so funny that when we do traditional it's like oh that's so ethnic and it's like, no, it goes back to our lineage. You know, it goes back to the way that we were raised, our grandparents being in the home, um, our great grandparents, things being passed down. And I think that traditional just needs to be opened up and not be so like when you say traditional, it's very Eurocentric. It's very European. And it takes away from the person in front of you who has their own spin on traditional to bring to you and to show you how to make that your own. I think that people have to be very open to it. I want to see traditional mean traditional for that designer and what they're going to bring to the table. And not that just me working with a white client, they have to understand that I'm going to bring a nuance of a traditional, what I know of, to their home and layer it in. And it's always so amazing that they're like, oh my God, like, you know, my clients are just like, I would have never thought that. Or, oh my God, this is so amazing. I have a client who I redid their apartment. They had a designer before. And when you walked in, it was very disjointed. Like it's an amazing 7,000 square foot apartment. And it, you know, you come in off the elevator and go right into their home. But it, it didn't pull me in and make me want to linger. And it was just very, 
it was funny. It was just very like, it was traditional. It was like that old school traditional where, you know, you put a table here, you know, you put an ottoman here, but it didn't make sense. And, oh, there's a corner. We need to put something in that corner. And so, you know, she went off, her and her husband went off to their home in the vineyard, on the vineyard. And when she came back, like she had, she has the most amazing artwork. Like it's insane. And there's this one where it's this wooden elephant head and it's called elephant ears and it has like the giant ears, but it's stunning. And it was, it was next to the TV and it got lost. And so for me, I thought that when you come in off the elevator, like it, First of all, that hallway, which it was just white, like it wasn't anything amazing. So I use this like amazing, not smoke embers, but it has like that grayish tone to it. And I had my art handler come in and we redid all the art. And when she came in, she was like, um, we need to speak. Um, I don't think you really understand like how this should be. And I felt really disappointed because it was absolutely amazing. And that was like eight o'clock at night. By midnight, she texts me. She goes, oh my God, this apartment is amazing. Like what you did with the artwork is so- Oh man. And I felt better about it because I I said to, you know, Ben, my husband, I was like, oh my God, she doesn't get it. She doesn't get it. Like she has all this beautiful artwork and it needs to be done the right way. And I mean, the furniture hadn't arrived yet. And so as she's looking through the next morning, she wakes up and she goes, I absolutely love what you did here. You know, my husband turned the corner coming down the hallway, going into the living room. And when you turn the corner, I had the elephant ears right there. So when you got off the elevator, that's the first thing you would see. And she was like, oh my God, like everywhere you put the artwork, it makes so much more sense. In her office, she was like, my mind is blown because the way you did the artwork, it is, it makes so much more sense. That is so cool. I love that you specifically called out your art handler and how you really put that as a focal point instead of what Eurocentric traditional design has always been. It's like, here's a console table. Something needs to go over right over that. Then you're going to get a bunch of orchids and layer it over the art right on top next to yeah, like <laughs> it all needs to make sense. And I think like, instead of going with the formula, like, you know, I'll say this, like RH has a formula, right? It's the sectional with the um, cocktail table, the ottoman in the middle, and they give you a swivel chair. But what about the rest of the room? You know, what does that say? And so many people, and I call them decorettes or PP decorators where it's just paint and pillows, they don't think of the room in its totality. And that's one thing that is missed in traditional where it's just like traditional. Okay. You put that there, you put this there. Okay. It makes sense. But the room also has to have a soul. And a lot of people miss that when they do their version of traditional and this, the room has to have a soul to it. And I think that's, that's what really needs to be brought to the forefront of not just being traditional, like the the swivel chair, the sectional, the sofa, but having the room really be nuanced makes sense and having the people want to linger in that room, but like really linger in the room and want to be there. So you're in a beautiful historic neighborhood of Jersey. You work in the city. You have all different types of clients. How do you bring your clients' traditions or culture to their spaces? So you mentioned bringing a little bit of your own and you'll have this different perspective where you'll bring in and surprise, like when you're working with a white client and they'll be like, I never thought of that and I love it. How do you bring their own culture into their spaces? I make them show me what needs to stay. And I really have a conversation with them about how they want to really live in the space, not just entertain because, you know, people buy homes and they're like, well, I'm going to be entertaining. I'm like, oh, sweetie, you'll entertain for the first year or two. And then you'll just (laughs) never want to invite people over to your house, you know, and you'll have these big parties. Like we used to have big parties in our home, like a hundred people, 150, right? Now it's like small, intimate dinners, eight or less. (laughs) And, And that's what it is. And so I get to you know, the nitty gritty of how do you really want your house to feel? Don't tell me all the beautiful things, but how do you really want it to feel? And what is important to you? And I have them walk me through the house and they go, you know, this is for my grandmother. I want to keep this. Or, you know, my mom gave this to me. This is really special. Or my aunt who I really loved, who died of cancer. This was in her house and this is something important to me. And so I weave that in, into what they tell me and what they say. And, um, 
and what they they really want to do. And I, I bring in their tradition and then I take it to the next level. You know, I love when clients try to Pinterest me to death with stuff. And I'm like, I don't want to see the garbage that you're showing me. Like you get one <laughs> time to show me and really tell me, but then I, I want you to really step back and trust the process. Because if, you know, you're tying my hands, then I can't do my job. Then you're, then why hire me? And so I make sure that they show me what's really important and, and what they really love. And then I just sit back and watch because, you know, I'll come back again and we'll have conversations and I watch how they are in the house with their family. And I'm like, okay, something clicks. And then slowly, like it clicks for me. It doesn't happen immediately all the time. You know, sometimes I'm just like, I don't know. I have no clue. Like I'll figure it out. And then all of a sudden I just, something will happen and I'll just start brimming with all these ideas. And then I just start sketching and then I start like really pulling a bunch of fabric and just like, Oh my God, this room is really coming together. And then I remember the pieces because I have the pieces up on the wall in my office and I'm like, okay, okay, okay. And then when I show them, they're like, how did you come up with this? And I'm like, I don't, it just, it, you know, it just started speaking to me. The space really started speaking to me. One of the things I'm most proud of putting into the world is Design Camp. I teamed up with my good friend, Lindsay Borchard from Lindsay Brook Design to craft a business retreat that both supports and empowers designers with the tools and resources they need to elevate their business. But the best part always proves to be the incredible community formed along the way. It really is the most magical four days full of the best conversation, great food, and actionable takeaways that leave you inspired and prepared to take your interior design business to the next level. If you're ready to invest in yourself and your business, visit design-camp.co to learn more. Again, that's design-camp.co. How do you handle when someone tells you, these are the pieces that need to stay, this is how I want to use the space, and in your gut, you know that that's not true, and you're like, I know that's not how you really live, I know that's not how you really are going to use this space. How do you handle shifting that mindset for them when you actually go to the presentation and you're maybe delivering something different than what they told you that they absolutely wanted. <laughs> well, that just happened. Um, <laughs> it was very interesting because the clients are moving into the home. They're not there yet. And they're like, well, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. And I, and I said, as a homeowner, I'm telling you how you think you will use this house. You won't. You know, and it was funny because with the living room, the space planning, the way I showed it to them, they kept saying, well, we need seating for like, you know, eight to 10 people. We need seating for eight to 10 people. And I was like, well, you can get eight in here. And so then, you know, the husband's like, well, we want, you know, two sofas, you know, two swivels, two this, two that. And I go, it, it's not good. It's not going to work. And they're like, well, that's what we want. So then I didn't, you know, AutoCAD, I showed it to them. They're like, that's perfect. And I'm like, oh my God. So I somehow I got into a conversation later on during the week with a husband and I said, okay, I have to be honest with you. Like you all don't need me. Just go ahead and do it. And it's like, no, no, no. Yes, we do. And I said, no, let me explain something to you. I'm never going to photograph that room. And here's why it looks like it's in a doctor's waiting room. And he's like, what? I was like, yeah. And I was like, the stuff you're picking is very funereal. Like I'm looking for a dead body. Like I feel like it's a funeral home and they're like, oh my God, really? And I was like, yeah. I was like, so either you're going to trust me because you, I was referred to you, like you seeked me out. So either you're going to let me do it and make it amazing for you, or we could just part ways now. Right. You know what you want. So you just go do it. Like, yeah, don't get me involved in this mess. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> as soon as I feel like I can't take the picture, I'm like, oh, okay, we have a Houston, we have a problem. Yeah. And even with um, a client, I'm doing their project now in Maryland. You know, I kept do I did the uh, closet, we took over a bedroom and made it into a closet to make a part of the primary suite. And how I had the doorway, she's like, I don't like that. I want the doorway here. And I was like, okay, so that doorway is only going to be two feet. No, but that's what I want. That's what I want. And so between me and the architect, like we drew it out several different ways and showed, no, 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 this is what I want. Right. So we did it. Framing happened. Everything's done. And she's like, oh, 
that doorway's too small. And I go, well, that's what you have to live with now. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, what? I was like, yeah. I was like, this is why you hire me. And it's funny because now when we talk about things and they'll ask her something, she's like, I, I'm deferring to Gail. This is what she does. She's the expert. <laughs> Learned her lesson. Yeah. And I was like, and for me, like, you have to do that sometimes. Like the client has to be taught a lesson. And I don't mean to sound like bitchy saying that, but they have to learn and like go, oh, okay, you're right. I get it now. That's such an important lesson. I wish everybody could get to it in your first initial meeting instead of yeah. <laughs> three months down the road. <laughs> yeah. And I'm very dogmatic and I will admit, I'm like, no, that's not happening. Like I'm very much that way to my clients and they, they, they get it. And then after a while they're like, oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> so Gail, you have such an incredible ability to make what I feel it are fairly formal rooms feel so cozy and so inviting. Everything you do feels so luxe, but also like it's always been there and you can put your feet on the sofa. How do you bridge that gap? How do you make everything feel so next level, but also like you could nap on the sofa on Sunday? Because it's how I live. And it's important to me, once again, I hate, hate when I walk into someone's home and it's a showcase and I'm like, it's a museum. And that's, that's another thing I say to my clients, you live in a house, it's not a museum. Like, oh, well, we can't get that because of my child. We can't do this because of my child. I'm like your child. You need to teach your children to live with beautiful things. You need to teach your children to respect beautiful things. You need to understand that you live in your house. It's not a museum. You need to understand that you're going to spill a drink and you don't need to freak out. And um, your dog will throw up on your brand new sofa that you just got, just happened. And that you're not going to freak out, that you're going to clean it up. And after it's all clean, it's still going to be plush and amazing and you can enjoy it. Um, I always <laughs> tell clients, I was like, you need to be able to read and you know read in that room um have conversations in that room entertain in that room um eat in that room and you know excuse the expression you need to even have sex in that room if you want to like your home is really where you you should be living your best life and it's a place where it should hug you and like make you feel really loved and just refresh and like you can take on the world again like you'll wake up and you'll be like, okay, when you leave the house, like it's amazing. I also learned very on like picking fabrics and all, like we go away on vacation. We spend all this money to stay at these best hotels and, you know, fly first class. Why wouldn't you do that every day for yourself? Why wouldn't you live like that every single day? So the same luxe materials that you get at these hotels, you know, the linen, the bed linens and all. I do custom bed linens for my clients all the time. And I was like, this is what you should have for yourself. Like I pick the threads, I work with, you know, my clients on it and with the company, the vendor, Casa del Bianco. They're amazing. I've been dealing with them for like 15 years now. And why wouldn't you do that for yourself? Like I always tell clients, I'm like, no, we're doing custom bed linen. They're like, no, I said, no, custom bed linen for you. We can get some stuff made for the other rooms too. And if you don't want, we can go somewhere else for the guest rooms and all for the kids. But for the, you know, the primary, I'm like, it's, um, you should have that. And so I do my best when I pick fabrics, I always make sure I pick the most amazing fabrics. And then, you know, I send them off to, um, you know, to one of my vendors who does like the Teflon coating on it. So it still is lush and all, but then you're also not freaking out if you spill stuff. That's amazing. I know that you have such experience and authority on textiles. And I think it's amazing you custom make the bed linens. That is just like next level. I'm going to have to come stay at your house. I'm just going to invite myself over and be like, let me check out these custom bed linens gets talking about. When you're done, let me know the size of your bed. I will get them made and you'll see, you'll see the difference. And even with the way like you wash your bed linen, I use, um, I do regular wash, right? But then I also do like a little cap of um, vinegar and then I do a cap of baking soda and I put it in the wash. I'm telling you, when you take it off and you put it on your bed, 
I always tell my clients, okay, you have to take a shower tonight and I want you to loofah. Here's a body scrub I want you to use. Like I'm very crazy about it. And then I'm like, I want you to shimmy in, get into your bed linen. And every morning, like the next day after they do it, they're like, that was some of the best sleep I ever had. (laughs) <laughs> oh my gosh. I love that. I'm going to start calling it a gale bed now. Like after we've changed the sheets, I'm like, okay, we have our nightly routine. Sheets have been changed. This is how we have to do it. Gail said so. <laughs> so Gail, you are super well known in the old school design world. Um, but I don't know if you even realize how idolized you are by this new class of younger designers. How do you bridge traditional layered luxe design with staying current? How do you keep things feeling fresh? I, I feel through color. I feel through mixing high with low. And I, um, I don't know. That's so funny. I, I didn't know that anybody noticed me. <laughs> um. Oh, they notice. They definitely <laughs> notice. And if you haven't noticed Gail before, you notice her now. <laughs> Trust me. Um. I don't know. I like to really mix it up and I just like to keep it fresh with, not with trends because trends come and go and like, you'll get screwed with that and you'll be like, why did I get that? Um, but I love like a good, you know, custom bed linen with, you know, maybe a mirror from what is it? Home goods or something. You know, like you just I was need- like, Gail, tell me what the low items you get. Honestly, <laughs> please. <laughs> Tell me about this low you do. <laughs> okay, so the low is the, the really low for me is finding things on the street. I am notorious for finding furniture on the street and I'm like, let's get that, but we're going to I'm going to get my guy to do it over with the most amazing fabric and let's see what we can do. Like I literally will buy furniture for like I bought a sofa for a client um for $35 and we did it over in this like $400 yard fabric and I had my guy you know re um like reupholster it but redo all the springs and everything and you could not tell the difference you absolutely could not (laughs) tell the difference so when I got it to my client she didn't know you know she didn't know and and it's been passed on to her daughter now like they fought for it And the one daughter has it in her new house now. And I just laugh. I was like, if you only knew the story. So (laughs) they don't know that you got it for $35 and custom made it for them? That is so funny. No, like I I will find furniture and I will just hold on to it. And then I'll be like, okay. And, you know, I every now and again, like, I'll go, oh, let me let me go get something. I go to Home Goods for like my dog stuff. Right. And then I'll just pass by and I'll like, "Mm -mm." and then I'll see something. I'm like, okay, let me just take that and put, push that off to the side and just leave that for a little while. And then all of a sudden I'll be like, oh my God, I have a project. I can use that in. A perfect spot for it. Yeah. Like with the show house I did for the kaleidoscope project in Massachusetts, that chair that's in there, that must've been in my garage for at least six years. Oh my gosh. It's, it was literally made for that room. That's so perfect. I'll make sure and link that project in our show notes as well. So people can see, cause that, I love how that project turned out. Um, Gail, this is probably because we're good friends and I know you on a different level, but I've always really admired your discerning take on client inquiries. You seem to have a great ability to vet a client before you onboard them and you don't have a problem saying no when it's not the right fit. That results in quality projects over quantity of projects. And I'd love for you to tell the rest of us commoners how you actually make that happen. (laughs) Which I think is funny because you have the best questionnaires for bringing people on, for onboarding people. Um, I learned long ago after taking on projects when I first started, this is not what I want. And how do I, how do I get to what I want? So one, I stopped doing free consultations and I upped my price. I was initially at like 250 and then it was two hours. And and then I was like, oh, okay, 350. And then I was like, you know what? My consultation now is an hour, maybe 90 minutes at best, the most. And it's $800 because I'm like, if you're going to pay it, you're going to pay for my time. You're going to see the value in it. And clients do. The ones that want me see the value in it. 
It also vets them because now they know going in, this is what they're going to get with me. I also talk crazy in the beginning about numbers. You're like, oh, I want, I want to have you. I want to have you. I'm like, okay, so your room, what are we talking about? Oh, well, I want my living room. I don't need anything great. I said, well, I'm not going to sit here and like, just do, you know, do a home goods run for you. You could just get a local decorette to do that. Um, if you're going to work with me, the, the minimum of your room is going to be about 45 to about $60,000. And then they're like quiet. And I was like, and then, you know, and then I'm like, and I'm hourly and I charge you hourly. And they're like, oh, well, can you do a flat fee? I know someone that does a flat fee. And I said, well, no, I don't do flat fees because that's my time. And when I'm working on it, I'm working on your project. And if you call me, that's a charge. And if you, I don't text. Um, so you won't, we won't be doing that. And they're like, oh, okay. And I said, and if you, you know, I do the whole space, there's nothing that you're going to go shopping and say, I want to fit that in the room. And they're like, okay. And I, and they're like, well, what if I, you know, like this drapery? And I was like, well, then once again, it's everything is I do is custom for you. We're going to make it look like you and not look like the rest of your neighbors who are in your neighborhood. Um, and they're like, oh, all right, well, let me get back to you. And as soon as they say that, I'm like, oh, they're not going to call me. Like they're, they're just done. And then it's funny, like out of the blue, sometimes they will call and go, okay, I'm done. You're right. Let me deal with you. And I just, you know, I just, I'm crazy talking about numbers from the beginning. Yeah. That's so important. I think one thing you mentioned that I'd like to circle back around on, you mentioned 45 to 60 K for a room. And I think what people new inquiries are often thinking is that that's their budget for furnishings any sort of construction that's like all in on the room but then you pointed out well my design fees are on top of that so i think a big key takeaway that people listening can make sure to clarify is that their total budget needs to include your design fees so if they're saying 45 to 60k and then you're going to be 20 percent of that on top of it i think that's a really critical thing that people coming to you need to understand up front because it's just not the way their mind works. Once it's explained, it's like, okay, yeah, I understand that my total budget needs to include your services. But people go into it thinking, great, I've got 60K for this project. And you're like, okay, well, that means you really only got 40 for the <laughs> yeah. actual room. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another thing that I thought was super interesting that you mentioned was that paying a premium on the consultation. Um, and a lot of people ask me, hey, will you roll that into, will you credit that towards my project? And the answer is no, I totally agree. I think people get sucked into worrying about, well, is this going to be what gets them over the fence? Is this going to be the deciding factor if I tell them that I'll credit that $800? And I just want to say, if someone's on the fence and that $800 is going to make or break them, you're going to have a lot of problems down the road because $800 is a small expense in this project. How you start is how you finish. Yep. Literally um, about two months ago, People reached out to me, husband and wife. Okay, we'll pay the eight hundred dollars. Do you roll that? No, I don't. They're like, well, we. I said, listen, you're paying for my time. That's my time for that moment. Okay, okay, great. We're gonna go with you. Send over the contract. Yada yada yada. Come back with the contract, and in the email they say to me, "Do you roll that over? Will you roll over the eight hundred? I know I spoke the Queen's English to them, and I was very clear, <laughs> right? And so I said, as discussed per our conversation on the phone, no, I do not roll that over. And I said, I thank you so much for thinking of me. I wish you the best of luck. <laughs> if they're going to start pushing back now, they're going to be pushing back the whole time. Yeah. Don't let people dictate how you run your business. That's like insane. I also want to circle around to your concept of hourly versus flat rate and why you would never do flat rate. The flat rate I have two opinions on one opinion. And to your point is you have no idea how these people are going to work. You have no idea if they're going to have a hundred questions a week or if they're never going to ask you a question at all. And you can get this thing ordered, wrapped up, just wait around for it to get delivered. So I think that's one thing that people really need to think about when they're talking pricing. The other side of it, Gail, that I've really thought about is when you're doing something hourly 
And if you are not vigilant at increasing your prices on a very regular basis, and I'm talking a minimum of every six months, you are punishing yourself for being good at your job. And what I mean by that is if you can do your job faster because you have more experience, you have more product cataloged in your brain, in your systems, and you're charging hourly, you're getting that project done sooner and therefore you're punishing yourself. So you need to make sure that you are constantly raising your rates to reflect your experience because your time spent on a project is going to go down as you gain more experience. So Gail, this is a pep talk to you. (laughs) I want you to go ahead and raise your rates again and just get it on your calendar that they should be increasing by 10% every six months. Eventually you'll hit a cap, but once you hit that cap, it is possible that you would switch back to a flat rate comprehensive fee that is a maximum up to 100 hours per project, for example. So that's another pricing structure I've seen people start to implement is there will be a flat fee up to X number of hours. After that point, it is billed back hourly yes. so that there's a little bit of a hybrid c- scenario where you don't necessarily need to increase your hourly rate because you're getting faster. You're going to tell them it's going to take 100 hours. You actually only take 65. You're still getting paid that bulk number. But if they're that pain in the butt client that just drags things out, you're still covered once you've hit that 100 hours and then can start billing back. So do you have any thoughts on that? No. Um, listen, I am, I am good about raising my rates. I am not going to lie. Like I am just like, I think it's time for an increase. Um, (laughs) I'm like, I'm damn good at this. Let me do it. Um, I, I struggle with doing flat fee because I've, I've been burned by it. You know, and so when people are like, oh, but it's so tedious to sit here and do hourly. And I was like, I pay attention to that. And you can never account for who's decisive and who's not because they can start out that way. And then all of a sudden, second guessing, triple guessing, and you're just like, oh, my God, you know, so when I say hourly, it really resonates for people and then it makes them go, "Okay." And then when they're lagging, they're like, I'm paying for it. You know, like, and that's the clientele I have. They're like, well, I'm paying for it. They know. Can you do this for me? Yeah. uh, No. And when I, I send my invoice at the end of every month, religiously, and I get paid by the fifth of the month because that's in the contract. I never have a problem. And it's all spelled out exactly what I do. Like there's a code for everything and I spell out everything that I've done. So you see where your hours are going. And they're like, Mm -hmm. okay, I know I need to not waste time on this, or I know I need to not do this. Or now they're like, just do it. I know you got it. I'm not even going to mess with you on it. How do you get past a scarcity mindset to allow yourself to say no to the wrong projects? How do you get past being like, if I don't take this project, I'm not going to make mortgage this month. How do you get past that? Oh my God, that is such a great question because that is That is something, the scarcity mindset is something you have to work on daily and you have to understand the value that you bring to your client. You have to understand the value that what you are doing, because guess what? If they could do it, they would, right? And if they could get the job done and make it look amazing like you do, then they would, but they can't. And you have to know that what your value is and what your worth is. And that doesn't happen overnight, you know? And you also have people around you like, oh, I would never pay that. And then they have you doubting yourself, but you have to know your worth and you have to understand how hard you have worked to get to where you are to be able to say, this is my number and stand firm in it, you know? And you have to say it with conviction and thank God, like I do say with conviction. I didn't realize I did because my clients don't flinch. Those who are for me, they don't flinch at all. And they're like, okay, let's do it. Yeah, it's daily. And I think no matter what industry you're in as a business owner, that's always something you have to consider and you have to outweigh. And I'm a firm believer that by saying no to the wrong projects, you have just opened up space for the next right project that will fulfill your bank account and fulfill your soul. And it takes being burned a number of times before you realize that those wrong projects are not worth it. 
So finally, this brings me to the question about show houses. I feel like you are super active in the show house circuit and every project you do in a show house just absolutely takes my breath away. What benefit do you see to participating in show houses and what do you like most about them? Or is there any reason why another designer should step carefully or steer clear from show houses as a designer? Okay. uh, The answer I'm giving is for both to steer clear and also to do it. Doing a show house is your opportunity to show who you really are as a designer and like your creativity. Don't go so over the top circus looney tunes throwing everything in, right? Because if that's not, it has to be a true blue representation of you. And you don't need to cram every idea into the show house. But for me, it's always been a release of like, oh my God, this sounds good. I Number one, I only do a show house where the labor is paid for, right? Because it's expensive to do a show house and I have my own house I need to do. So I only do a show house where the labor is paid for. I always take the smallest room possible. Everybody wants the biggest room. It's easy to show who you are with a big room. It is tough to show who you are because you need to get creative with the small space, right? And you can use as much color or as little color and make it very impactful. But to do a show house, a lot of people go in, they're like, well, do you get business out of it? I want to make sure I get clients. You're going in with the wrong mindset. You need to go in going, one, I'm going to have fun. Two, I'm going to show, you know, I'm really going to take advantage of this and show people what I can do with this space. And three, I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to use the vendors that I really want to use and I'm going to go high end. I'm going to go low end. I'm going to take that chair out of the garage, you know, whatever it is and show who you are. I think people go, a lot of designers only want to do a show house because they think they're going to get a client out of it. And you may down the road and not have it happen immediately, you know, and you have to really just be honest with yourself about it. But if you if you 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 just need to be mindful is what I'm saying. I think when we were working on your website together, the projects that were front and center and the things you were most proud of were a lot of those show houses because it was exactly Gail. It was your vision. It was exactly what you wanted to execute. And you didn't have the. I don't want to say constraints, but the boundaries that are maybe provided in a project when you're working with a client. So I definitely see the value in even if you don't get a client directly from the show house who walked the show house, who saw your space down the road, you have portfolio, you have a portfolio of work or at least a project in your portfolio that speaks so true to yourself. And that's where that dream client or that client that is going to be a successful project can resonate and um, really feel attached to you by seeing that work. So as you were talking about, as you're working through a project and you know, I'm not going to photograph this, I feel like the show houses are your chances to have a space that you know you're going to photograph. You know you're going to want those because it's exactly what you wanted. Yes. And it comes out exactly how you want it. And you're so proud. Like every time I'm done, I'm like, God, this was so much fun. Like my soul feels so good. My spirit felt, you know, felt like it was set free. And then those are the best pictures, you know, and then now people that are looking for me, they're like, oh, I love that. You know, I love what you did here. I love that. And then they, they just step back and they're like, go for it. Amazing. Well, Gail, is there anything else you would like to share with us before we finish up with our outro? Yes. If you need a new website, I'm speaking to all designers. You really need to speak to have ID code do it. It is so important because that is your your first step or your face forward to a client. And if you have some website that you think you can do as a designer, I am an interior designer. I am not a website person. Let ID Code do your website. Thank You're you. Welcome. No, seriously. <laughs> I had a girlfriend the other day. She's like, well, do you have like a standard response for this? And I'm like, 
go to ID Co., go to their website, go buy one of the packages. As we wrap up, Gail Davis is so clearly a force to be reckoned with as a designer, but more importantly, she is a dear friend to hold sacred. You can follow along with Gail on her own podcast, Design Perspectives, linked in the show notes. I highly recommend you subscribe with new episodes every week and you don't want to miss out. To see her beautiful portfolio of work, visit gaildavisdesignsllc.com. That's Gail Davis Designs LLC.com or follow Gail on Instagram at Gail Davis Designs. Thank you so much for joining me today, Gail. As always, I'm leaving this conversation with you more educated, inspired, and humbled than I started it. I hope you have a great weekend and I'm sure I'll get to see you very soon. Absolutely. Thank you, my love. If you weren't able to write down everything you heard today, you can find all the links, projects, and images we referenced and other details from this episode of the Interior Collective on our website at idco.studio forward slash podcast. Be sure to follow along on Instagram and subscribe to our newsletter to stay up to date on what we're talking about next week. If you love our podcast, please leave us a review. If you have questions or topics you'd like to hear next, go ahead and email me at hi at theinterior.co. Again, that is hi at theinterior.co.